Michael Weber, Artistic Director of Chicago's Porchlight Music Theater. Premiering in movie theaters May 29, 1942, Yankee Doodle Dandy, with a screenplay by Robert Buckner and Edmund Joseph, featuring songs by George M. Cohan, was the biggest box office success in Warner Brothers history up to that time. George M. Cohen wrote and produced more than 35 plays, many of them with his partner Sam H. Harris, and composed more than 500 songs. Modern critics have attributed his importance to the fact that his theatrical career survived and helped define the transition from vaudeville to the American musical play. The idea of a film about Cohen had made the rounds of the studios for some time, with Fred Astaire initially considered for the role, which he would decline. To many, the natural choice was actor James Cagney, but he had initially been opposed to a biopic of George M. Cohen's life, having disliked Cohen since the actor's equity strike in 1919, in which Cohen sided with the producers. However, in 1940, Cagney was named, along with 15 other Hollywood figures, in the grand jury testimony of John R. Leach, the self-described chief functionary of the Los Angeles Communist Party, who had been subpoenaed by the House Un-American Activities Committee. The New York Times printed the allegation that Cagney was a communist on its front page. Cagney refuted the accusation, and Martin Dyes Jr. made a statement to the press clearing Cagney. William Cagney, one of the film's producers, is reported to have said to his brother that, quote, we're going to have to make the goddamnedest patriotic picture that's ever been made. I think it's the Cohen story, unquote. And so, Cagney would become Cohan. Ironically, press notes included Cagney was also Cohan's first choice to play him on the screen. Cohan himself served as a consultant during the production of the film. Due to his failing health, however, his actual involvement was limited. In devising the screenplay, the creators discovered Cohen's life was so oriented towards theater, the writers complained, quote, he had no outside interests. His only objective was success, and he achieved it with monotonous annual regularity, unquote. When Cohen objected to the way certain parts of his life were portrayed in the screenplay, the producers explained in a letter dated August 29, 1941, that many biographical films took some liberty with the facts, thereby gaining dramatic interest. Quote, Under your construction, the story is concerned largely with your chronology of productions interspersed with personal scenes. We believe that the deep-eyed Americanism of your life is a much greater theme than the success story. Unquote. According to memos included in the Warner Brothers collection, Cohen was opposed to any portrayal of his private domestic life. He specifically objected to the character of Mary, the screenwriter's largely invented romantic interest. In real life, Cohen married twice, the first time to actress Ethel Levy, and the second time to Agnes Mary Nolan, a chorus girl who had been a member of his company for three years. According to an August 2nd, 1944 Variety article, Levy later unsuccessfully sued Warner Brothers for violation of her rights of privacy in making the film. A New York federal judge stated that, quote, the introduction of fictional characters and a large fictional treatment of Cohen's life may hurt Miss Levy's feelings, but they do not violate her rights of privacy, unquote. Preparing for his portrayal, Cagney was instructed in Cohen's choreography and style by dance instructor Johnny Boyle, who was a former member of the Cohen and Harris Minstrels and who had appeared on Broadway in the Cohen Review of 1916. Other actors of note in the film include James Cagney's real-life sister Jean Cagney, who plays Cohen's sister Josie. James Cagney was 20 years older than Jean. In the film, Josie Cohen is presented as George's younger sister. In reality, she was his older sister. It was the first time the Cagney siblings would appear in a film together. Rosemary DeCamp, who played Cohen's mother, was in fact 11 years younger than James Cagney as her son. 
Joan Leslie, who portrays Mary Cohen, aging from 18 to 57 years throughout the proceedings, turned 17 during the production of the film. The fact that she was still attending high school during production caused numerous delays. Yankee Doodle Dandy offered legendary actor Walter Houston his only film opportunity to show his singing and dancing skills. While he had appeared in the Broadway musical Knickerbocker Holiday, his characterization in that show of peg-legged Peter Stuyvesant ironically offered him limited dancing opportunities there as well. This radio adaptation of the film was the first episode of the Screen Guild Players under its new sponsorship by Lady Esther Cosmetics. Listen for the end of the broadcast when the entire wartime studio audience joins in a rousing chorus of Cohen's song, Over There. Here on the October 19th, 1942 broadcast of the Screen Guild Players are, from the original film cast, James Cagney, Joan Leslie, Walter Houston, Gene Cagney, Richard Worf, S.Z. Zakal, Charles Irwin, and Art Gilmore in Yankee Doodle Dandy. presents the Screen Guild players in Yankee Doodle Dandy. This is James Cagney. Joan Leslie. Paula Houston. And this is Jean Cagney. Lady Esther and all the stores who bring you Lady Esther face powder and Lady Esther face cream present the Screen Guild Players, starring James Cagney and Joan Leslie, with Walter Houston, Gene Cagney, Richard Wharf, S.C. Sockhall, and Charles Irwin, in musical highlights from Warner Brothers' forthcoming brilliant motion picture, Yankee Doodle Dandy, based on the 50-year theatrical career of George M. Cohan. <laughs> This is the story of a real Yankee Doodle Dandy, a man who told the world proudly, I am an American. It is the story of George M. Cohan, who loved and understood his country, and through singing his songs, that country learned to understand itself. Well, I'm glad to hear people say I understand my country. However, not long ago, I, uh, I created a misunderstanding without meaning to. It really had me worried. I was impersonating the President of the United States in a play called I'd Rather Be Right when I received a summons to appear at the White House. Oh, I was really upset when I walked into the president's office. Well, how's my double? <laughs> I'm not sure, Mr. President. You'll have to give me time to work on that one. Are you sure you'll realize why I sent for you, Mr. Cohan? No, Mr. President, I, I, I don't know. I, but if it's because you, uh, you object to my impersonating you on the stage, why... Well, you know, Mr. Cohan, I remember seeing you and your family, the four Cohans, when I was going to school near Boston. Oh, I was a pretty cocky kid in those days. Regular Yankee Doodle Dandy, always in a parade or following one, wherever there was a flag. I hope you haven't outgrown the habit. It's a great quality. Well, I guess I got the idea from my father, Mr. President. He, he ran off to the Civil War at 13. Well, some years after the war, he married my mother, and they toured the variety theaters of the country as Mr. and Mrs. Jerry Cohan, the Irish Darlings. Then on the 4th of July, 1878 in Providence, Rhode Island, my father was playing a variety theater alone. <laughs> Larry O'Leary is my name by trade. I am a dancing master. There's no one can teach the same. Nor teach it any pastor. It's easy, very easy. If you'll watch every twist, every turn. Keep your eyes upon me and surprise you will be. It's the dancing you have yet to learn. (laughs) 
Keep your eyes upon me and surprise you will be at the dancing you have yet to learn. Mother should have been with him on the stage, but she was busy in a smaller production. Father hurried to her as soon as he had finished his turn. But uh, that was once I made an entrance ahead of Father. Are you, are you all right, Nellie? Yes, Jerry. Is, is everything all right? Everything is grand, Jerry. You're the brand new father of a brand new boy. A boy, it is. And born on the 4th of July. Praise be. We call him George Washington Cohan. Well, Jerry, the George is fine, but, but the Washington won't be too long for billboard. Yeah, that's right. Well, now, how about a good short Irish name? Dennis or Michael. George Michael Cohan. I like that name. Mr. President, I was six or seven years old before I realized they weren't celebrating my birthday on the 4th of July. <laughs> I can understand that. In fact, life to me has been a roundup of parades and songs. Often, of course, they went together, but not always. When I wrote Mary, the only parade I had in mind was the one that takes a man and the girl, the girl, down the aisle. And I'll never forget the night my Mary sang the song I'd written for her. My mother's name was Mary. She was so good and true. She called her name was Mary. They called me Mary too. She wasn't gay or airy, but plain as she could be. I hate to meet a Mary who calls herself. Feeling, having a name set in music. You know, I'd like everybody to know that it was written for me, that I'm being married. Well, that's easy. How would you like a lifetime job? George M. Cohan's leading lady. One of the play contracts and no options. I think I might like it, Mr. Cohan. Could I uh, be a sample of my part in the strip? Well, here's how it starts. How would you like the first reading? Could we have another rehearsal? <laughs> it was Mary. Mary. Long before the fashion came. For there is something there that sounds so square. It is so round. Oh. I didn't get as quick or effective results every time, though, Mr. President. Another parade I used to lead was the parade of frustrated playwrights marching from one producer to another. I just about given up hope of ever getting my musical show, Little Johnny Jones, produced when I, I walked into Rector's famous restaurant one night. Uh, Sam Harris was seated at a table talking to another man who didn't appear too interested in the sales talk Sam was giving him. Uh, I didn't know Sam's name then, but I, I'd met him in several producers' offices trying to sell his play, so I knew what he was after. When the villain tells the boy, I'll tell your girl who you really are, Mr. Help me hold up the stage, folks. You'll have the audience in the aisle. Sure, just like me, walking out of the theater. I tell you, before I put $10,000 of my wife's money into a show, it's got to have songs, dances, and lots of girls. That was my cue. Schwab wanted songs, dances, and lots of girls, and I had a musical comedy under my arm. 
So I moved in and told Harris under my breath, Listen, mister, I have a musical. Schwab won't buy your play, but if you help me sell him the musical, we're partners. What do you say? What can I lose? Well, partner, did you sell the musical to Deaton Golf? Well, they're ready to sign the contract as soon as we can get over to their offices. Come on, then. Let's go. But, 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 but for that, did you say something about the musical? Why haven't I heard about it? Oh, you wouldn't be interested. It's nothing but a lot of hit tunes and thousands of girls. <laughs> thousands of girls. Yeah, lots of music. I don't mind music under those circumstances. Why ain't I producing it? That's a good question. I will give you my check for $10,000 right now. That's the perfect answer. Let me be the first to congratulate you, Mr. Schwab. Oh, thank you, thank you. You are most very kind to let me in on this. By the way, does our music have a name? It's called Little Johnny Jones. All about Todd Sloan, a famous jockey. It's a... There's a... Give my regards to Broadway. Remember me to Herald Square. And tell all the gang at 42nd Street that I will soon be there. And whisper of how I yearn to mingle with that old-time frog. Give my regards to old Broadway and say that I'll be there ere long. We'll give your regards to Broadway. Remember you to Hello was a pretty good tune this day, Mr. President, but my favorite song from Little Johnny Jones was Yankee Doodle Boy. You remember? That's all the candy. I'm a Yankee Doodle Dandy. I'm glad I am. I'm a real-life Yankee Doodle. Made my name and fame and boodle just as Mr. Doodle did by riding on a pony. I love to listen to the Dixie strain. I long to see the girl I left behind me. That ain't a Josh. She's a Yankee, by gosh. Oh, and you about a Yankee that's all for me. Little Johnny Jones, a Yankee from the USA. Well, ride the pony, Yankee Doodle, English Derby Day. Johnny broken records every track and every beat. So Yankee Doodle's gonna be the boy they have to beat. Sportsman but not the pretty child who followed his career. Have offered Johnny anything to keep him over here. But all the money in the bank of England couldn't pay enough to keep young Johnny Jones away from old Broadway. If you want to take a tip to show us some of your things, have your house mortgage, hop your watches, pawn your rings, and put it on Yankee Doodle Johnny Jones' line. I am going to give America the English Derby Cup. He's going to give America the English Derby Cup. I'm a Yankee Doodle Dandy. Yankee Doodle do or die. Hurry, my nephew, of my uncle Sam. Born on the 4th of July. I've got a Yankee Doodle sweetheart. She's my Yankee Doodle joy. Yankee Doodle came to London just to ride the ponies. I am the Yankee Doodle boy. He's a Yankee Doodle dandy. A Yankee Doodle do or die. That's Yankee Doodle on the end, a wonderful position. Look at him rear, he's broken line, he's simply wild to run. Now he's back in line again, there's the starting gun. They're off! Come on, Yankee Doodle, we have catch a hook, a boodle, like it. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Yankee takes the lead. Come on, Yankee Doodle, we have catch a hook, a boodle, like it. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Yankee takes the lead. 
Continue in just a moment with the second half of the Lady Esther Screen Guild play, Yankee Doodle Dandy. But first, a brief message from Lady Esther. I am very happy and really quite a bit thrilled to present to the women of America this new Lady Esther program, the Screen Guild Players. Now you know, of course, that you yourselves, you who are listening out there tonight, have made this program possible. For millions of you, have chosen Lady Esther Face Powder and Lady Esther Face Cream as your favorite aids to beauty. Yes, more lovely women today use Lady Esther Face Powder than any other kind. And millions of women, busier than they have ever been before in their lives, have chosen my one cream, Lady Esther Four Purpose Face Cream, for the complete care of their skin. So you see, it has been your own loyalty to Lady Esther Cosmetics that now brings you the leading screen stars and the best directors and writers of Hollywood in this new Lady Esther program. Every Monday night, this new Lady Esther program will bring you your favorite stars in the most popular movies and plays of the year. I hope you are enjoying tonight's presentation, and I hope you will continue to enjoy the Lady Esther Screen Guild plays for a long, long time to come. Hi, this is Porchlight Marketing Manager Austin Packard. Thank you for listening to WPMT. If you value programming like this, please consider making a donation today at porchlightmusictheater.org. We appreciate your consideration and hope you enjoy the show. Now the curtain's ready to rise on the second act of Yankee Doodle Dandy, starring James Cagney, Joan Leslie, Walter Houston, and Gene Cagney. Back in the White House office of the President of the United States, where he has been summoned by presidential order, George M. Cohan is nervously continuing the story of his life. Well, Mr. President, uh, little Johnny Jones is a great financial success. And it wasn't long before the four Cohans, mother, father, my sister Josie, and I, were appearing in George Washington, Jr. We all sang the big number in that production, the grand old flag. The feeling comes to stealing, and it sets my brain a reeling when I listen to the music of a military band. Any tune like Yankee Doodle simply sets me off my noodle. It's that patriotic something that no one can understand. Way down south in the land of cotton, 
melody on tiring. It's so inspiring. Hurrah, hurrah, we'll join the Jubilee. And that's going some for the Yankees by gum. Red, white, and blue, I am for you. Honest, you're a grand old flag. You're a grand old flag. You're a high-flying flag. And forever in peace may you wait. You're the emblem of the land I love, the home of the free and the brave. Every heart beats true under red, white, and blue, where there's never a boast or brand. But your old acquaintance be forgot, keep your eye on that grand old flag. Say to that. Yeah. Well, tell them, tell them anything. Just so you tell them. Well, uh, you know, thank you. It's all right, but you, you all have to come with me. My mother thanks you. My father thanks you. My sister thanks you. And I thank you. Just the beginning, Mr. President. Life from then on was a series of new shows, new theaters, new towns, trains. And all of a sudden, it was 1917. Our enemies of today were our enemies then. The declared war on Germany. Like every other man, I tried to enlist, but they turned me down. As I walked out of the Army doctor's office, one of the fellows standing outside said... Don't worry, pal. We'll take care of them over there. Huh. Give me an idea. Over there. Hmm. I keep repeating that phrase to myself. Over there. Over there. Over there. Hmm. It sounded like a like a great title for a song. And I hurried home to work on it. nerve taking up your time with the story of my life. Why didn't you stop me? Why, I wanted to hear the story of your life. It has a direct bearing on my sending for you. Here. Huh? Do you know what this is? It's a Congressional Medal of Honor, isn't it? Yes. Now, let's see what the inscription says. To George M. Cohan for his contribution to the American spirit. I congratulate you, Mr. Cohan. I, uh, uh, but are you sure there hasn't been some mistake? <laughs> Quite sure. Well, this medal's only for people who've given their lives to the country. I'm just a song and dance man. Everybody knows that. 
A man may give his life to his country in many different ways, Mr. Cohan. Your songs were the symbol of the American spirit. Over there was just as powerful a weapon as any cannon, as any battleship we had in the First World War. Mr. President, I, uh, I'm just beginning to earn this medal. Quite a thing. Well, it's the best material we could find, what with priorities and all. Mm-hmm. Well, goodbye, Mr. President. My mother thanks you. My father thanks you. My sister thanks you, and of course... I think. And uh, don't worry about this country, Mr. President. Where else in the world today could a plain guy like me sit down and talk things over with the head man? Well, that's about as good a definition of America as any I've ever heard. Is there something wrong, Mr. Cohan? Hmm? Oh, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's the same old trouble. Thought I heard a parade coming down Pennsylvania Avenue. It is a parade. Don't you recognize the music? I ought to. The marching song of 1917 is the marching song of 1942. If I were Hitler, Hirohito, or Mussolini and heard that, I'd take one long look at history and start running. James Cagney, Joan Leslie, Walter Houston, Gene Cagney, Richard Worth, S.C. Sockhall, Charles Irwin, and Arthur Gilmore for your contributions to the opening show of our new season with the Lady Esther Screen Guild Players. Our sincere thanks, too, to Warner Brothers for permitting us to begin our season with highlights from Yankee Doodle Dandy, one of the year's greatest pictures, with words and music by George M. Cohan. Two hours of grand movie, which will be playing in your community. A picture which every American must see. And now, the star of our show and the newly elected president of Screen Actors Guild, James Cagney. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, my mother thanks you, my father thanks you, my sister thanks you, on behalf of George M. Cohan, I thank you. His presence has been strongly felt by all of us here tonight. And we sincerely hope that his story has helped you to understand this great man who, through his songs, has helped our country to understand itself. I'm sure he'll be happy to know that all the benefits derived from this new series of Lady Esther Screen Guild plays go to the maintenance of the Motion Picture Relief Fund's country house for the members of the profession he loved and served so well. Now, as president of the Screen Actors Guild, I would like to extend a warm welcome to Lady Esther, whose sponsorship makes this program program possible. We can assure you that this is going to be a great series, bringing to your loudspeakers the brightest stars in Hollywood in the most successful screen plays. Jack Benny, Robert Taylor, Barbara Stanwyck, Cary Grant, Rosalind Russell, Bing Crosby, Bob Hope, Hedy Lamarr, to name just a few. Next week, for instance, the Lady Esther Screen Guild players will bring you Tyrone Power, Betty Grable, and John Sutton in A Yank in the R.A.S. I want you to know that the stars who are contributing their time and services on this program have only one wish. And that wish is the hope that you listeners will enjoy the plays as much as we enjoy the opportunity of bringing them to you. Walter Houston. 
Hoffman will soon be seen in Warner Brothers' Edge of Darkness. And Richard Horff is now making assignment to Brittany at Metro Golden Mayor. Next Monday night, then, same time, same station, Lady Esther will present the Screen Guild players in a yank in the RAF, starring Tyrone Power with Betty Grable, John Sutton, and Pat O'Malley with music by Wilbur Hatch. This is Truman Bradley saying good night for the Screen Guild players and Lady Esther. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. George M. Cohan was awarded the Congressional Gold Medal by Act of Congress, not the Congressional Medal of Honor, as stated in the film. He was, as said in the film, the first member of the entertainment profession to receive this award. Subsequent entertainers to receive the medal are Irving Berlin, Walt Disney, Bob Hope, Danny Thomas, John Wayne, Marian Anderson, Frank Sinatra, and Aaron Copeland. In a voiceover in the film, James Cagney, as Cohen says, quote, I was a good Democrat even in those days, unquote. In reality, Cohen was a lifelong ultra-conservative Republican who despised President Franklin D. Roosevelt. Cohen's dislike for the president was such that although awarded the Congressional Gold Medal in 1936, he put off meeting with Roosevelt until 1940 to receive it. This occurred when the White House staff noted that Cohen would be in Washington, D.C. for the out-of-town tryout of his play The Return of the Vagabond. It seemed an opportune time to arrange the meeting, and Cohen agreed. It was fortunate timing, as that play turned out to be Cohen's last, and he never appeared on stage again in Washington or New York. During the creation of Yankee Doodle Dandy, the filmmakers worked rapidly in order to complete the film before the ailing Cohen died. They held a special screening for Cohen and his wife, Agnes, and Warner Brothers moved up the scheduled gala premiere from July 4th to May 29th. The original date had been chosen because of the film's patriotic theme and because in the movie, Cohen is said to have been born on the 4th of July, as he wrote in the lyrics of his song, Yankee Doodle Dandy. However, Cohen was actually born on July 3rd. In the end, Cohen lived long enough to read the film's rave reviews and to comment publicly on how much he admired James Cagney's performance. The film was released nationally on July 6th, 1942. George M. Cohen died of cancer exactly five months later on November 6th at the age of 64. Instead of tickets for the film's New York premiere, Warner Brothers sold war bonds ranging in price from $25 to $25,000. A June 1, 1942 news item notes that over $5 million was raised for the war effort. Also, the event was the first time James Cagney ever attended the premiere of one of his own movies. Cagney won his only Oscar for his performance in this film and, in doing so, became the first actor to win the Best Actor Academy Award for a musical performance. Cagney recreated his role as George M. Cohen in the 1955 film The Seven Little Foys, a biopic about the life of Cohen's contemporary Eddie Foy, starring Bob Hope. In 1959, a statue of George M. Cohen was erected in Times Square in the heart of the Broadway Theater District. It is the only statue of a theatrical performer anywhere in Manhattan. In 1985, Yankee Doodle Dandy became the first black and white movie to be colorized using a controversial computer-applied process. Despite widespread opposition to the practice by many film aficionados, stars, and directors, the colorized version won over a sizable section of the public in sales on its release. Theaters across the country need your support now, more than ever. We hope you'll consider a donation to Porchlight Music Theater today. Just go to porchlightmusictheater.org. Until next time on Classic Musicals from the Golden Age of Radio, I'm Michael Weber. Michael Weber